if there are a limited supply of these things, 21 million, it's kind of like you want to own them and, you know, avoid the rush by now <laughs> because they're going to because they're going to be more expensive in the future. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, we're going to have a million dollars of coin in 10 years and mm -hmm. you know that's going to be meaningful. Um, so, you know, could we, but we could have a million dollars of coin a lot sooner than 10 years also if, if we hit that tipping point, in my view. It's, it's a amazing. form of money that's superior to government money. This is, this is a form of money that can't be printed. It's sounder than anything a government can create um and there and it's you know it's super easy to transfer and move around bitcoin uh, bitcoin will become much much more you know ubiquitous and easy to use so that you know my mother can use it i mean right now my mother's not going to do you know she's not going to store shit on a trezor and do on-chain transactions welcome back to crypto insights in this video we will bring you the highlights from larry leopard's recent interview on bitcoin news as always time is money so don't forget to like subscribe, and hit the notification bell to stay updated on the latest developments in the crypto space. Bitcoin is the same thing. I mean, I can, you know, 40 years, everything's going to be denominated in sats because what we've got here is a form of money that's superior to government money. And if you look at history, you know, the best technology always wins. I mean, you know, when as Safe says, when, when gunpowder got invited, invented, you know, people kind of stopped using spears and, and and axes. They started firing bullets. You know, and and so, you know, this is this is a form of money that can't be printed. It's sounder than anything a government can create. Um, and there and it's you know it's super easy to transfer and move around. Uh, and therefore, I think it's destined to become the base layer of money. Um, now, is it today? No, of course not. Um, you know, ten percent or less to use it. Um, you know, the, the, it's, it's slow in a traditional sense, in the sense that, you know, 10 minutes to settle, um, you know, and it's expensive compared to, you know, I mean, you don't buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin because, you know, the, the, the on-chain fee is too high, but, but, you know, that's why there's a layer two and that's why there's lightning and, and all these, all these other solutions. I mean, just as I, I recall very clearly my boss back in 83 saying, yeah, these PCs aren't that useful. I'm, you know, I can't see where, where this is really going to go. And, you know, what you could see was that, you know, Intel was, Moore's Law was happening on the microprocessor. You just knew that every year the stuff was going to get better, you know, that we we're going to get graphic cards and graphic user interfaces. And it just, you know, one thing after another was going to make it all better. And I think the same is true of Bitcoin. Bitcoin will become much, much more, you know, ubiquitous and easy to use so that, you know, my mother can use it. I mean, right now my mother's not going to do you know, she's not going to store shit on a trezor and do on-chain transactions. It's just too complicated. Mm -hmm. But but that that if that that functionality will be available to everyone for pennies uh, at some time in the future in a very easy way and in, in an idiot-proof way. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's going to take five years, ten years to fully roll that out. So, um, but I but I can just you know I can see it clear as day, and I think I think Lynn and, and uh, uh, Michael see it as well, and so. Um, you know, my view is if there are a limited supply of these things, 21 million, it's kind of like you want to own them and, you know, avoid the rush by now <laughs> because they're going to because they're going to be more expensive in the future. I mean, you know, I, I, I often talk about how much fiat money there is out there. And I talk about, you know, I mean, as an example, there are 54 million millionaires in the world. There are 21 million. I mean, every millionaire in the world couldn't even own one Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So if you own one Bitcoin and this becomes money. You know, you're kind of almost by definition a billionaire, or I mean a millionaire. And you know, you can buy a Bitcoin today for well, today for sixty-four thousand, like a week or a couple of weeks ago for seventy thousand. So, um, which is a lot of money, but it's not, you know, it's not out of the reach of of people who have savings. So, or many people who have savings, I should say. So, um, yeah, it's um, to me, it's it's pretty obvious where we're going, and you know, how we get there is a little less clear. I mean, it depends on how much the Fed prints and you know, how quickly and how steeply this occurs. I mean, one thing that is a little different, I've talked about this in other podcasts, is we live in a very digitally connected world and, and word travels quickly and, you know, information travels quickly. And I mean, look at us talking, you know, continents apart and video streaming one another. You know, I mean, you couldn't do this even five years ago. So, um, you know, it, it, the adoption could happen even quick, more quickly than we think. I mean, we just don't know. You know, I mean, we're going to have a million dollars of coin in ten years, and mm -hmm. you know that's going to be meaningful. Um, so, you know, could we, but we could have a million dollars of coin a lot sooner than ten years. Also, if if we hit that tipping point, in my view, the, the measures are fuzzy, right? We don't know exactly what percentage of people are using Bitcoin, but 
in my in my estimation, we're kind of rapidly approaching that 10% point. And, um, you know, I mean, there's probably not many people in the developed world who haven't at least heard of Bitcoin. They may not be using it, but they're aware of it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that's going to grow and uh, I think, you know, accelerate. You know, the implied prices, and I've got some charts and so forth that show that, that, you know, it's going to continue to, you know, kind of every five or six years, you know, go up by a factor of 10x. And so, um, you know, I, I take that into account. It, uh, it also varies a lot around the mean. Um, you know, you get these runs often driven by a halving um, that shove it well above its 200 day moving average. And then you get the collapses that bring it back down to below its 200 day moving average. But but in general, the, the trend is very strongly up. And so to me, the power law is a useful piece of data. Um, you know, and I know some people, some Bitcoiners say, well, all your models are broken. You can't have them out. Fine. Okay, great. I, look, I'm an investor. And, I, you know, if I see something that from a data standpoint that has has been predictive looking backwards and therefore might be predictive looking forwards, I, I find that useful. Now, I'm not saying it's definitely the explanation for what the price is going to do, because one thing that, that argues against the power law is the Gladwell tipping point thesis that, you know, um, if we truly are in that phase where, you know, we go from 10 percent of the population to 90 percent of the population, you know, we might break the power law and exceed it to the upside. And I think that's clearly one of the possibilities. So um, so I, I keep both of those ideas in the back of my mind. Um, I know Bitcoin is going higher. <laughs> um, and I but I but honestly, I don't know, you know, I don't know the path. And anybody who's been in this space for a while knows that, you know, if you try and predict price on this thing, it can really humble you. I mean, you you know, you can be absolutely convinced it's going to go up and it goes down and you can be absolutely convinced it's going down and it goes up a lot. And so, you know, it, it's 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 a little bit of a wild beast. And so, you know, th thus the phrase hodl, you know, I think you just you buy it. And you hang on to it and knowing that, you know, given enough time and letting time and adoption do its thing, it will be much higher mm. in five years and 10 years and 15 years. How much higher? You know, look, that's we don't know. We just we just don't know. We, we haven't we've never really seen anything like this before. I mean, as you know, and as I think many have pointed out, this is a commodity that does not have uh, that does not respond to higher prices with greater supply. You know, if, if the price of gold goes up, we'll mine more gold. The price of oil goes up, we'll drill more oil. Wheat goes up, we'll plant more wheat. We know the supply of this thing from now until forever. You know, it's asymptotically decreasing to the point where we get to 21 million of them in 100 years. And so, um, you know, the the price can go up a lot and the supply stays the same. Uh, that, we've never seen anything like that. And that's, that's why it's, you know, that's why it's traded the way it has. And so... You know, we're all kind of getting trying to get our heads around it, and it's hard. You know, mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, it, the whole all the religious wars about you know this model works and that model works and this is shitty. Yeah. No, I mean, I my view is they're all worth discussing and looking at and thinking about. Um, you know, will it will it work? I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, but it's it's not. I don't think it's. I, I don't think you can casually discard it. You know, how do people get in trouble in this thing? Two ways. One, they lever themselves up. You know, I, I know a guy, you know, remember when Plan B had his model, we were going to 150 immediately. And, you know, some guy, you know, believed in that and he took out a loan of three Bitcoin. He had one. Mm. And of course, we had a big correction. Boom, he lost his one. You know, he, he got margin called and lost his one. So, so you know, leverage is dangerous in this whole area. You cannot be leveraged. You've got to be, you've got to have, you know, full skin in the game. And then the second thing I think that happens and it's incumbent upon all us, all of us as Bitcoiners is we try to orange pill our friends and we get people involved is to make people aware of this is a hold forever asset mm -hmm. and to make them aware of honestly and be open about the fact that there are big drawdowns. There have been big drawdowns, you know, 60, 70 percent. And um, I often say to people, look, when you're buying this thing, you know, you've got to understand that there's some chance it could go down 50 percent. And if it did. Your, your response should be, I'm going to buy more rather than, oh, my God, I made a mistake. I'm going to sell. Because the, the other time I've seen people get hurt is when they when they don't fully understand it. They buy into it at a high price, like the last rip up to 68000 Then Sam Bank from Freed happens. It goes to fifteen They feel like shit. You know, they think they made a mistake and they sell it. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas if they just hung on to it, they ultimately would have been fine. But um, so I think it's important for all of us as we tell people about it to make them aware I mean, we don't want 
we don't want people who are going to rent Bitcoin. And, and actually, that's with the ETFs, I worry about that a little bit, too, that some people are going to buy this thing in the ETF. They don't really know what they've got, you know, and, and it's going to go up. Maybe they'll have a profit. They'll sell it, which will be a mistake, you know, or they'll get a big drawdown and they'll sell it, which will be a mistake. I mean, it's it really, you know, it's very important to let time do its thing here. It's working and it's going to continue to work. And so, you know, that that problem when it started off in 1971, you know, the numbers were small enough. It really didn't matter. Um, and you could add debt and GDP would grow. And the fact that there was a difference wasn't a problem. But we've now gotten to the point at which the GDP, you know, the debt is growing very rapidly. You know, and GDP is, I mean, as an example, right now, debt, it looks like it's growing about 10% a year, the U.S. federal debt. And the U.S. GDP is growing about 2.6% a year. So that's a problem because that GDP is what's used to pay that debt. And at some point, there's going to be a day of reckoning. Now, you know, we've had some quasi days of reckoning. I would argue that 2008 was one of them and that 2020 was another one. Those were the two big ones. We've had some smaller ones like the Silicon Valley Bank failure, which created a ripple or the, the repo blowout in 2019. But, you know, the system is straining against this problem and it really hasn't been resolved. So it's, you know, and it's, you know, Reinhardt, Reinhardt and Rogoff did a paper. These are two well-known economists. And they showed in like, you know, 50 some odd countries that had debt to GDP of north of 130%. And we're at like 125 right now. In almost all those cases, well, in, in every case but one, and the one is Japan, which it hasn't, it, it could have a problem, it hasn't yet. Um, ultimately, you have very high inflation or, hyperinflation or, you know, a debt default. Um, and those are the, kind of the three choices. So so it doesn't, you know, history suggests that countries that have done this, the outcome's not good. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why those of us who are in this sound money camp, you know, are trying to warn our friends and family and people who aren't aware of what's going on in this area of the, you know, the potential problem. And you know, the difficulty is, I mean, I've been, you know, I, I'm kind of like the boy who cried wolf, right? Because I've been warning about it for 20 or 30 years and it hasn't happened yet. I mean, it's kind of happened. I mean, 08 happened and 2020 happened. They print a lot of money, but but the big one hasn't happened yet. And I'm not sure the big one will happen, but I'm pretty sure that they will continue to debase the currency and that we are not out of the inflation problem that's got started in, you know, 2021. Well, I mean, you know, how hard is it to extrapolate to something similar with the U.S. federal government? I mean, you know, they have a failed bond auction. Um, the, you know, the yield the repo rate blows out like it did in 2019. Uh, interest rates shoot up very high in an uncontrollable fashion. Uh, the Fed steps in and says, you know, we're going to buy these bonds. Um, and in order to do so, we're going to print, you know, I don't know, $5 trillion, $8 trillion, $10 trillion. I mean, doesn't that send everybody thinking to themselves, holy shit, you know, there's no limit to how many, how much they can print. And having studied hyperinflations and the history of hyperinflations, I mean, hyperinflations and high inflations, and I, I don't like the word hyperinflation because it implies like, a, you know, a doomster mentality and I'm not a doomster, but, but these things do occur. I mean, and it is, you have to, you consider, you have to consider it's one of the tail possible outcomes and they tend to occur when everyone comes to the conclusion that, you know what? I can't trust this government. They are never going to stop printing. Mm 